Good morning, everyone. In unison, good morning, your honor. In unison, good morning. Council, you may proceed. Thank you, your honor. Mr. Klapakis, did you suggest last week that because of your discussions with the FBI you delayed fingerprint analysis for a year? Last week, do you mean Wednesday? Oh, that's right, that's right, you're right. How about Wednesday? Did you suggest that the FBI, your discussions with the FBI had something to do with a one-year delay in analyzing fingerprints? No, my discussion with the FBI had to do with basically doing background investigations for us as well as computer work for us. Did you suggest that the Department of Justice and the State of California does not do fingerprint analysis? What I suggested was that their priorities are for other agencies, and we can do fingerprints ourselves. But they do do fingerprint analysis, correct? Yes. And at times your office will use the Department of Justice to do fingerprint analysis, correct? I believe that we have, but it's very rare. We do it ourselves. Do you know somebody named George Levine of the Department of Justice? Yes, I do. Who is George Levine? He's an examiner with the Department of Justice. And what does he do, to your knowledge? Well, he does a lot of things, but I believe fingerprints is one of them. And how long have you known him? Oh, I think George has been with the agency longer than I have been with the Sheriff's Department. So over 20 years. Have you worked with him on fingerprint analysis before? Yes, I believe we have. Now, did you suggest to the jury that because it took so long to separate pages out of magazines that fingerprint analysis in this case needed to be delayed for a year? That's not what I suggested. What did you suggest when you told the jury about the laborious process of removing pages from magazines? Well, that it was a multi-phase process, and that we wanted to, there were several things that we had to do. We wanted to maintain control over the evidence, and not piecemeal it out. And because portions of the magazines were in different locations, we had to do those phases at different times. And are you saying that contributed to a delay in analyzing fingerprints? Yes, it did. Okay, and how long was the delay in analyzing fingerprints that you would attribute to separating out pages from magazines? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. You've said that separating pages out from magazines caused a delay in analyzing fingerprints, correct? Yes. The delay was approximately one year, correct? Approximately. Are you attributing that delay exclusively to your need to separate out pages from magazines? No. Okay. Now, as the head of the search of Mr. Jackson's residence, you were in charge of determining what forensic tests would be done of anything found in the residence, true? I was part of that process, yes. Did you ask for any forensic tests on any bottles that seemed to contain alcoholic beverages? No. Do you know if any forensic tests were done on bottles that seemed to contain alcoholic beverages found at Mr. Jackson's residence? I don't believe we did. You saw bottles that seemed to contain alcoholic beverages in the wine cellar, correct? I believe some of the investigators did, yes. And you found bottles that seem to contain alcoholic beverages in the kitchen, correct? Yes. And they appeared to be in unlocked areas, correct? Correct. You found bottles that seem to contain alcoholic beverages in Mr. Jackson's bedroom, true? Yes, there was a bottle of alcohol in his bedroom. Do you know if any forensic tests were ever done on any bottles that seem to contain alcoholic beverages in Mr. Jackson's bedroom? Not to my knowledge. Did it ever occur to you that trying to determine whose fingerprints were on bottles of that sort might have merit in the investigation? Well, it would. My belief is, is that we were talking about something that occurred eight months prior to the service of the search warrant, so the answer would be no. How long do fingerprints tend to last on surfaces, based upon your experience as a police officer? They can last that long, at least. They can last many years, correct? Yes. Given what you had heard about potential charges, did it ever occur to you that trying to see whose fingerprints were on glasses or bottles, glasses that seem to have contained or are used to contain alcoholic beverages or bottles that seem to contain alcoholic beverages, might be relevant? We didn't at the time. Okay. Did you do it at any time? No. 
When the search went on in Michael Jackson's home, did you have a particular location where you had either a desk or a chair? Did I? Yes. I believe, I'm not quite sure I understand. Did I have a desk or a chair? Did you, as head of the search, did you have a central location in the residence of Mr. Jackson where people came back and forth to report to you? No. I don't believe I had a central location, no. So were you essentially walking around the residence during the entire search? I was moving about the estate, yes. Okay. And were you supervising what people who reported to you were doing? I along with others. Okay. Was your function primarily a supervisory function? Yes. Did you ever ask for any fingerprint analysis of items of furniture in Mr. Jackson's bedroom? No. Did you ever ask for any fingerprint analysis of various boxes you saw in Mr. Jackson's bedroom? No. Did you ever ask for a fingerprint analysis of a lot of the mannequin-type toys you found in Mr. Jackson's bedroom? No. Did you ever ask for a fingerprint analysis of anything you saw on the floor in Mr. Jackson's bedroom? If some magazine material was found on the floor, yes, we would have, but... Was the fingerprint analysis you requested only directed at magazines? I believe so, yes. Did you ever request any fingerprint analysis of anything you saw hanging on the wall? No. How about the railing on the stairs going into Mr. Jackson's bedroom? No. How about any of the doors you have to go through to enter Mr. Jackson's bedroom? No. Now, other than fingerprints and DNA analysis, is there any other type of forensic test you wanted done during the day of that search? During the day of the search, no. Were the forensic tests that you asked to be done limited to looking for DNA and looking for fingerprints? Well, we, I also believe that photography is part of forensic work, and so we photographed the different rooms of the estate and different things of that nature, but limiting it to that, yes. Was any effort ever made to see if you could find fibers, hair or material? in Mr. Jackson's bedroom that you could link to any of the Arvizos? Well, when we took the bedding from Mr. Jackson's bed, I wasn't limiting it to biological fluids. I was limiting, basically, I wanted a complete analysis of anything that they found out there. So, we took the, all the bedding and left it to the examiners to determine what evidence might be on that bed. But and clearly, you never found any of the Arvizos DNA in that bedding, correct? That's correct. And you never found their hair or fibers in that bedding, correct? That's correct. And you never found any of their prints on any furniture linked to Mr. Jackson's bed, correct? That's correct. I have no further questions at this time. Redirect? Let's go back to some of the things you were talking about last Wednesday that Mr. Mesereau was asking you about, and specifically the execution of the search warrant. You were asked by Mr. Mesero about what you typically do in a typical murder case. Not that there's really a typical murder case. But with regard to a murder case that occurs in a residence, all right? When you have a murder case that occurs in a residence, what are you legally required to do in order to process the crime scene? We have to obtain a search warrant. And when you obtain a search warrant from a judge to allow you to process the crime scene of a residence, are there ordinarily any time limitations placed upon you in terms of how long you can remain at the residence to complete the process of the crime scene? No. We could. It could take a day. It could take a week. Whatever it takes to process the scene. And have there been cases involving your agency in which crime scenes have been secured and processed over the, over days and weeks? Yes. Have you ever, in your experience, and to your knowledge with the Sheriff's Department, had a residence and a ranch of the size of Mr. Jackson's that you've had to ever search? No. And just so the jury's clear on this, there was more than one building searched that day, correct? There were several. In addition to his residence? Yes. Would you consider the residence a typical search by your department? No. Why? Well, it involved a very large main house on the estate. It also involved different buildings on the estate. The estate, the house, was packed with a lot of things that we had to go through. We had to make sure that we were very careful with them. And the search also conducted was in different locations within the estate. Did you know at the time that you executed the search warrant on November the 18th, 2003, whether or not Mr. Jackson was present on the ranch? 
we were not aware that he was on the ranch. Now, with regard to the time constraints given to you with the execution of the search warrant on Mr. Jackson's ranch, what time constraints were you given on that? I was told that I had to be done within a day. And how did that come about? Well, I had asked you if we could write in the search warrant that we could take a couple of days or more to conduct this search, because of the size of the estate, plus the other things involved in this investigation, other searches. And through that discussion, it was decided that we were going to have to do it within one day, so as not to burden the ranch and its employees with our presence longer than that. And was there some relationship between the amount of time and the number of personnel that you needed to do it within the time constraints that you were given? Well, based on the size of the estate, we felt that in order to get it done within that time frame, we had to have an abundance of personnel. It wasn't just the search. All right. Now, with regard to the questions Mr. Mesereau asked you about whether you gave any instructions to the people who were under your supervision during the execution of the search warrant, do you recall that question? Yes. What were your instructions to your people? Do not talk to the press. You were also asked by Mr. Mesereau whether or not you had, whether or not there were media that were, that came outside the ranch on the second search warrant that was executed almost a year later in December of 2004. Do you recall that? Yes. And with regard to the source of the information that was given to the media, to your knowledge, was the sheriff's department responsible for that? No, we were not. And to your knowledge, was it somebody connected outside of the sheriff and law enforcement community? That's what I believe. Now, Mr. Mesereau asked you several questions about items that were found at certain locations and used the word, unlocked. To your knowledge, was the wine cellar unlocked when you folks first got into the building on the morning of the 18th of November? The wine cellar was locked. And with regard to the closets in Mr. Jackson's bedroom where the alcohol was located, to your knowledge, was that locked or unlocked at the time it was first approached by your folks? His bedroom was locked and alarmed. And the closet in which the two bottles of alcohol were found? Was that closet locked or unlocked at the time that your folks first approached that closet and opened it? The, I'm not sure of the location you're talking about. Downstairs in the master suite. The master suite was locked. And the closets in the master suite? I'm not sure of that. I know I wasn't the one of first ones to enter into the master suite. I know that, I was, excuse me, I was the first, one of the first ones to enter the master suite. But as to the closets, I can't tell you. All right. One closet was locked. It was on the, it was on the left side library, our left side bathroom, excuse me. There was a locked door there. The one with the jacuzzi type tub? Next to the safe, yes. Okay. Now, before you executed the search warrant or before the search warrant was executed on November 18th, were you aware of the interviews that had been conducted with the Arvizo children? Yes. And were you aware of the information that they had provided about the interior of Mr. Jackson's bedroom suite area? Yes. At the time that you were executing your search warrant on November the 18th of 2003, how much time had elapsed between the time that you had information that the crimes were committed and the time you were executing the warrant? Nine months. Eight. Nine months. Now, at that time, Mr. Mesereau asked you whether or not you took any prints off the balcony or whether you looked for hair or fibers or anything else. Was there a reason that wasn't really an important part of the investigation at that particular stage in time? It just didn't enter into the investigation at that particular time. Why? Well, we were, we had certain information regarding the crimes. We went into the search looking for those things. Our search was limited in time, and we were doing several other things, interviews, other searches in other locations. The, this investigation was atypical because it entered into other, other crimes, other overt acts in which we had to investigate. With regard to the presence of the Arvizo children in Mr. Jackson's master bedroom and in the suite itself, at the time you were executing the search warrant, can you tell us whether or not there was any doubt in the investigators' minds that they had actually been in those rooms? No. They described it uniquely, and it, we actually knew where we were going when we. Objection. Calls for hearsay and speculation. And also it's improper. Sustained. Judge. What's the basis? Because I may be able to cure it. Because I didn't think it was hearsay. Well, you're talking about what was in the other investigators' minds. I'm sorry, then I can cure it. 
with regard to what was in your mind as the lead investigator during the course of the execution of this search warrant, were you aware of the information that the Arvizo children had provided to you? Yes. And with regard to that information, did that have an impact on you with regard to trying to prove whether or not they were ever in those rooms? No, they had described it. And when we entered the room, it fit their description. All right. Mr. Mesereau asked you one other. Another question with regard to whether you were trying to explain what he uses the word delay in the processing of the print. And you answered the question, no. Why was there no? You didn't consider that to be a delay of over a year. As Mr. Mesereau stated, latents can stay on an object for a long time. We were protecting the items of evidence. They were in different locations. We were conducting our processes as we were able to. And ultimately we were able to develop and stabilize the latents that we felt were on the items of evidence. Were there other items that were taken that you believe could have been processed for forensic evidence? Sure, we could have fingerprinted some alcohol bottles or other things like that, but we didn't. With regard to this particular case, there are a number of books that are in evidence. Yes. You're aware of that? Yes. Was there a conscious decision made with regard to those particular books and processing them for the latent prints? Right. The, the books, in a discussion with Mr. Zonin, was, we determined not to conduct a latent fingerprint examination on them, because the process to do so would have, one, destroyed the book and made the pages toxic. Mr. Zonin preferred to keep the book in its original condition, and so the decision was made not to attempt the latent search on them. Thank you. Nothing further. May I just take one second, Your Honor? Yes. Off the record discussion held at council table. Your investigation. I'm talking about you personally, Lieutenant, began approximately June 13, 2003, when you were contacted by attorney Larry Feldman, true? No. I started this in February. Okay. If that's, I began in February 2003. Okay. But in the operations plan that was developed and typed up for the search that you were in charge of, you attached a case timeline, correct? The sergeant who developed the ops plan did, yes. And that was Sergeant Eric Koopmans, correct? Koopmans, yes. Did he develop that plan with your assistance? Certainly mine, Sergeant Robles. With respect to that search, you talk about you being contacted by attorney Larry Feldman on Friday, June 13, 2003, correct? I believe that was the date. Okay. Do you know why that timeline doesn't include the investigation you were doing much earlier? The ops plan is basically the synopsis, a brief synopsis, of giving the investigators some background on our investigation. I can't tell you why it didn't have the February information. And the timeline associated with the operations plan doesn't include the fact that you personally called the Department of Children and Family Services and asked them not to interview the Arvizos, correct? Your Honor, this is beyond the scope of the redirect. I object. Sustained. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Nothing further, Your Honor. You may step down. Your Honor, we'll call as our next witness Jack Green. When you get to the witness stand, please remain standing. Face the clerk and raise your right hand. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. Okay. My name is Jack Green. G-R-E-E-N. Sir, would you speak into the microphone? Okay. Good morning, Mr. Green. Good morning. How are you employed? I'm the president of Affordable Telephone Systems in Ventura, California. And what is Affordable Telephone Systems? We're an AT&T equipment dealer. And what do you do for affordable telephone systems as the president? Run the operation. All right. Do you actually go out to sites and perform services in relation to telephones themselves? I do. Uh-huh. And how long have you been doing this? 20 years. Do you have a background in, do you have any training in the area of telephone systems? I do. Could you describe that for me, please? I was trained by AT&T Corporation. All right. How long ago? In 1984 to 1990. What kind of training did you receive? Technical training on their systems from their corporate trainers. 
And how long did this training take place? Over what period of time? Over the course of 10 years. All right. And I take it you've had some hands-on experience with this subject matter? Correct. Over the 20 years you have performed services for telephone systems? Yes, I have. On, you know, could you even estimate how many times? Oh, geez, thousands. Okay. On December 3, 2004, did you visit Neverland Ranch in Los Olivos, California? I did. And did you have an assignment when you went out to the ranch that day? I did. What was your assignment? To inspect the telephone system at the ranch. And to give information on how the phone system was configured, programmed and would operate. Were you accompanied by law enforcement officers on that date? I was. And did you perform that task? I did. First of all, tell me, what type of system does Neverland Ranch have? What type of telephone system? It's manufactured by AT&T. It's called a Merlin 2 system as the model. It's a, we call it a key system, a hybrid key system. Okay. Are you familiar with the Merlin 2 system from AT&T? I am. Have you serviced that system before? I have. So tell me what you did. How did you go about inspecting the system? We, we inspected and looked at how many telephone lines that were, from the telephone company on the property, were installed in the system. We logged and inventoried all of the telephones at each location on the system on the property, and looked at how the system was programmed in terms of how you could make a call out, how you could receive a call. You know, the typical aspects of how the system would work. And how many lines did you find that system included? How many different telephone lines? On the property, there's a total of 24 telephone lines or numbers, telephone numbers that come onto the property. Of those 24 lines, there are 8 lines that's connected to the Merlin 2 system. Okay. And the remaining 24, I guess we have 16 lines remaining. Correct. Tell me about those. There's one, there was one line that was not, that was not on the system of the 8. There were 15 lines that were connected to modems or computers or, you know, other things. Okay. Were all of those 15 lines being used? They had dial tone. I don't know if they were being used. There was dial tone at what we call the DeMarc. Some of them might have been used. Some of them might not have been used. What did you say? The DeMarc, or the? The demarcation point from Verizon. I see. And where is that located? That's located in the garage, where the telephone equipment was at. Did you have access to the entire property? Yes. Did you visit the various outbuildings as well as the main residence? Yes. Did you inspect the phones at each of those? Yes. Locations? Uh-huh. And did you inspect a phone that was located in what's known as Mr. Jackson's personal bedroom? Yes, sir. May I approach, your honor? Yes. Mr. Green, I show you. Go ahead and help yourself to some water. Yeah, I appreciate that. I show you people's exhibit number 165. Can you identify that for me, please? That is a Merlin 34 button telephone. Is that the phone that you saw that day? Yes. Okay. May I have the Elmo, your honor? Do you have that laser pointer? Yeah. I believe this exhibit's already in evidence, your honor. Am I correct in that? What number is it? 165. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Mr. Green, can you just briefly describe for the jury how this telephone works? Sure. This telephone. Okay. All right. You have. If you lift the handset and you want to make a call out, this system is programmed, what we call in the phone industry, pooled. What I mean by that is all eight lines on the phone system, on all the other phones on the property, they, they are a 10-button phone, except this phone. On this phone, you have your telephone lines that are on each button here each of the eight lines. So, if I, from this telephone, I can manually push this black button right here, or any of these black buttons, and I can manually select any one of the eight lines that I want to make a call out on. On the, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but on the other telephone sets, they don't have the lines that appear individually on a button. You just, you just press a pooled button, and the telephone system selects at random a line that you're going to call out on. And you enter an account code and then you get a dial tone and you make that outside call, and you can, from the ranch. All right. So the other phones on the ranch, well, let me start with, 
Was there another phone that had similar capabilities on the ranch? Yes. There were two phones. Yes. There are two phones on the ranch that you could select a line to call out on, or, or listen in to a telephone conversation on. That other telephone set was in the, I would call it the administrative office on the ranch. It's a larger console, larger than this. Okay. And was that in a separate building from the main house? Yes. Yes, it was. Can you tell me, approximate its location in relation to the main house? Yeah, it was in what I call the big administrative office. It wasn't a security office. It was up the hill. It was the, it was the administrative office, the best I know it. All right. Now, if I understand correctly, the other phones on the property, you could not select which line you were going to use. Correct. The other phones on the property look just like this phone, except this row and this row of buttons were not there. It's a 10-button phone. So it looked exactly like this, minus, if I could just draw down here, exit that off. You're indicating the right-hand portion of the phone. Those buttons were gone? Correct. Now, but you still could not, you have these eight buttons, or it looks like. The line buttons. Yeah, two lines of buttons on the left. They had those buttons? Yes. Would that allow that person on a, let's say in the guest room, would that allow that person to select a particular line? No, no, all you could do is lift the handset, press the pooled button, and the phone system would select a line. Okay. The phone cabinet, I'll call it a CPU. You also mentioned that in order to get an outside line you needed to enter a code. What did you mean by that? An account code. All right. The phone system was restricted to where you couldn't just pick it up, have dial tone and place a call. You had to enter an account code. So if an individual did not have the account code, then it would be impossible for them to talk to an outside party off the ranch. That's, yes, to my knowledge. Uh-huh. All right. Now, can you tell me what the term, barging, means? Yes, we referred to it in telephone. It's our term that I want to, I want to join a conversation that's in place or I want to listen to a conversation in place. Or in business, since this is a business phone system, it was transferred for office business use, if I was on line 1, and I wanted you to join me in that conversation, you could press the line 1 button, and you could join the conversation. Okay. So in a business setting, that would let a secretary barge in a conversation. Would that be a reasonable use? Yes, or. In business? Sure, or join the conversation. All right. Did this phone have barging capabilities? Yes. Could you listen to this phone surreptitiously, and I mean secretly without letting the parties know that you were a third party listening in on that conversation? Yes. And how would you do that? Well, from this telephone, if I saw that somebody, if a telephone, sick, on the property was on the phone, I would see, on one of these line buttons, I would see it lit. There would be a red light lit. And so if I wanted to listen in on that conversation, all I'd have to do is press this black button, lift the handset, press this black button, and I could listen to the conversation, because I've got what we call line access. I can select the line I want to listen in on on this. Or I could press the speakerphone button, and mute it, mute the microphone, and press the line I wanted to listen in on. All right. And if you, well, let me strike that. Does that phone have instructions on how to do that? This phone right here? Yeah. No. Not on the telephone it doesn't. All right. So if you didn't know how to do that, you wouldn't be able to barge in without the other people's knowledge. Is that fair to say, if you didn't have some kind of idea about how this phone worked? True. I'm going to object. That calls for speculation. Overruled. The answer was, true. Next question. And would it be any difficulty, would there be any difficulty in connecting a recording device to this phone? Objection. That calls for speculation. I think he's an expert in this area. Then it's vague as phrased. Overruled. You may answer. You could do that, yes. And I believe you said one of the ways you could listen in was on the speakerphone? Yes. If you didn't want to hold the handset, all you had to do is just press the speakerphone, and then press the line button, and you could sit there and listen to the conversation without, hands-free without lifting the handset. Would you also want to hit the mute button? You could also hit the mute button so that it mutes the microphone on this telephone, so the caller that you were listening in on wouldn't hear any background noise. So they couldn't hear you breathing, or talking, or anything like that. 
Correct. Correct. All right. Mr. Green, did you bring, did you make a report in this case? Yes. Yes, sir. Did you bring that with you today? Yes, sir. If I could just have a moment with counsel. Off the record discussion held at counsel table. Mr. Green, I show you People's Exhibit 298. Uh-huh. Is this a refined version of your report that you prepared in this case? Well, I'm going to object to that question. All right. Can you identify this exhibit, then? Yes. Those are the telephone numbers that I found on the property. All right. And there are two groupings of them. And I'll put this on the Elmo. May I refer to my report? Yes, you may. Why don't you check and make sure that these are correct, the correct numbers? Uh-huh. They're right here. There is one additional number on there? Yes. Was that the private number that you mentioned? Correct. Off the record discussion held at council table. All right. Mr. Green, I'm going to ask you to write that private number on this exhibit at the bottom portion of it. All right. So does this list contain a complete listing of all the telephone numbers that you found in the various systems at Neverland Ranch? That's correct. Ask to admit People's Exhibit 298 at this time, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'm going to object and I'd like to approach on a very specific issue, please. All right, I'll sustain the objection at this point. Okay. Mr. Green, may I have the copy of the report that you brought with you? Yes. All right. I'm going to ask to have this marked as an exhibit as well. Mr. Green, I show you exhibit number 299. Okay. Would you identify that for me, please? Is that the new number? That's the new exhibit number, yes. This is the report that I made on December 3rd from Neverland Ranch in my inspection on the phone system. Is that a complete copy of your report? Yes, sir. There appears to be some handwritten items on that particular report. Did you make those notations? Yes, sir, I did. I'm going to object on the grounds of relevancy and its hearsay. Well, I'm laying. Just a minute. Overruled. The answer was, yes, I did. Next question. And did you prepare this report pursuant to your duties as the president of Affordable Telephone Systems Incorporated? Yes, I did. And have you prepared similar reports concerning telephone systems as part of your duties at Affordable Telephone Systems? Yes. I'm going to object. Relevancy. I can make an offer of proof, if you like. Overruled. And so was this prepared during the course of your business activities at Affordable Telephone Systems? Yes, it was. Was this report prepared at or near the time of the event that you described in analyzing this system and visiting Neverland Ranch? Yes, I prepared. You know, I prepared this information at the ranch as I was, as I was taking my notes. And then did you reduce it to a writing when you got back to your office? Yes. As far as the handwritten notes on here, what do those designate? Objection. Calls for hearsay. Sustained. Did you write those handwritten notes on there pursuant to the information that you were preparing for this particular report? Yes. Is it just some additional handwritten information pertaining to this particular report? Yes. Objection. Asked and answered. Leading. This is foundational. The objection is overruled. Was it done pursuant to your preparation of this report as a business record? Yes. And was it also done at or near the time of the events that are on this, reported on this particular report? Yes. Is this report trustworthy? Yes. Objection. Why do you say that? Sustained. Move to strike. Stricken. Do you have a duty when you prepare these reports to accurately depict the information that you've observed when you go out to the actual location? Yes. Objection. Lack of foundation. And leading. Sustained. On which grounds? Leading. It's for foundation, your honor. Well. Your, the objection was sustained. Ask your next question. All right. Ask to admit number 299 as a business record, your honor. Objection. Hearsay. No foundation. I'm just trying to look at some of your earlier testimony. When did you go out and make that report? 
on December 3, 2004. And who requested that you go out to make that report? The Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department. All right. It's not a business record. It was done in preparation of litigation and it's not admissible under the business records. All right. We'll do this. This will take a little bit of time. Okay. But I do need to get the information. Excuse me. Move to strike counsel's remarks. That's fine. I'll go to the next question. Wait a minute. Just a moment. I'll strike the remarks. Tell me. You know, I don't like to have conferences, but I need, I don't know what the problem with this record is that's causing all this difficulty. So would you come up here and tell me? Yes. Discussion held off the record at sidebar. It's amazing what a little conference will do occasionally here. The problem, which I didn't get, maybe you got, was that those are all Mr. Jackson's private phone numbers, and he doesn't want to receive all of those telephone calls. So that was the only problem. And so we're going to work with this as best we can, as long as we can, without revealing his personal phone numbers. And I don't know if we'll succeed in doing that, but that's what we're going to try to do here. And that's fine, your honor. The people would seek, ask to admit at this time exhibit number 298. And I don't have an objection to the foundation being laid for 298, but I'd ask the court just procedurally to delay receiving it until we work this out. They're having trouble in the back hearing you. I'm sorry, the thing's turned off. Yes, your honor, I was just saying I don't have any objection to the foundation for 298 based on this witness's testimony at this point. I just ask the court to delay receiving it in evidence until we work out the details. Okay. And that's fine. I'll make that ruling. That the parties agree that the foundation is laid, and we'll not admit it at this point until we can do something with the phone numbers. That's fine. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. Mr. Green, how are you? Good. Pretty good. All right. Let's just clear up a couple things right off the bat here. First of all, this phone system, this Merlin phone system that you saw at Neverland Ranch, is a fairly standard business kind of phone system, correct? That's correct. And the Merlin phone system that you saw, that particular configuration, was really one that was developed and used primarily in the 1980s, is that correct? That's correct. Phone systems have actually progressed quite a bit farther than what you see there, right? That's correct. And that's the kind of phone system that in the late 80s you might have found in executive offices, insurance companies, lawyers, and so on. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. It was designed for business use. And in your experience with affordable telephone systems in Ventura, have you had occasion over the last 20 years to install phone systems on large estates? Yes. Yes, I have. Have you ever installed a phone system on an estate as large as Mr. Jackson's? No. Okay. Have you installed a phone system on an estate that involved a working ranch? I probably have. I don't recall at this point. Okay. What I'm getting at is, where you have a number of operations going on besides a residence, is there anything unusual about seeing a business kind of telephone system on a working ranch? Oh, no. Not at all. It's, no. Okay. And what you might do, I think you're doing okay, but try to talk real close to the microphone there. Okay. Because it is hard for everybody to hear. All right. And particularly with regard to the Merlin system, it would not be unusual to see a Merlin system like that installed in a working ranch somewhere in the 1980s, correct? No, not at all. And the fact that this phone system has not been switched out for a brand new system is also not unusual. Is that correct? Not at all. All right. So you would expect at working ranches and other business locations that there are probably some Merlin systems still around. Is that correct? Oh, sure. Hundreds. Thousands. All right. Now, you mentioned that. You were asked. Is it possible to attach a recording device to this telephone system, correct? Yes. Did you see a recording device attached to this telephone system? No. All right. And in fact, it's possible to attach a recording device to just about any telephone system, correct? 
That's correct. All right. So there's nothing in particular that makes this phone system any more susceptible to being attached to a recording device than any other, correct? No. Now, another thing we talked about here was being able to pick up a line that's either in use or not in use on this particular phone, correct? Correct. In a typical telephone installation in a home, where you have more than one extension, is it usually possible to pick up a line that's in use in the system? Yes. So people who have two or three extension phones in their home generally have just exactly that system. You pick it up. If it's in use in the kitchen and you pick it up in the bedroom, you can listen in, right? Yes. Home systems that have more than one line often have that same capability. You can pick up line one. Let's say you have two lines. You can pick up line one or line two if it's in use, correct? Correct. All right. Now. The history of business phones, without going into unnecessary detail, before Merlin involved a couple of different kinds of technology I want to go over with you, okay? The first one is, for those of us old enough to remember all this, it involved the business phones that had the four, five lines with the buttons at the bottom and a, hold, button at the end, correct? Correct. And there might be actually an intercom button on one end, and the, hold, button on the end, correct? Correct. And under those old systems, if anybody in the property that was governed by this phone system, whether it be a residence, a ranch or a business, if anybody was on line one, everybody else on the phone system could see that from their phone, correct? That is correct. And they could just push the button and pick it up, and they'd be on line one, and they could listen in, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, in those days, there were speaker phones, somewhat primitive, as I recall. But it would also be possible to put a call on a speakerphone that same way and listen, correct? Correct. I'm going to object. It's irrelevant to phone systems that existed before this phone line. Overruled. Thank you. After that, let me withdraw that. At the same time as that more rudimentary system existed there was the PBX system, is that correct? Right, there were two types. After that, the equipment that you're describing was called 1A key. And then they developed a key system and a PBX system at the same time. The PBX was simply a larger model of a key system. Okay. And the PBX system continued into existence into the 1980s, correct? Yes. And it's still today. Uh-huh. PBX system would allow an operator to answer the phone, and then switch the calls from one place to another throughout the system, correct? Correct. Or an individual could do it. All right. When the hybrid key system came along, which is the Merlin system, correct? Correct. It was a system that allowed more flexibility than the PBX system, correct? Yes. So it would allow a, it would allow you to have a master console, or in this case you have a master console and you have sort of a junior master console, right? That's correct. And the junior master console was the one that was found in Mr. Jackson's living room area of the first floor of his bedroom suite, correct? That's correct. And that allowed people to answer the phone at different locations, is that correct? Back up there. You lost me. You could answer the phone in the administration building with the big console, right? That is correct. And you could join phone calls from one point to another? That is correct. And to the extent that you have the eight lines here, you could do the same with this phone, is that right? That is correct. Now, since that time, technology has continued to march on, since the 80s, I take it, correct? That is correct. And I don't want to go into all the details, but there are more sophisticated telephone systems that are much simpler than this, so you don't have to have all these buttons in order to make them work, right? That's correct. Now. You mentioned that there were eight lines that were on the direct system. Well, let me withdraw that. There were eight lines that were on this system that could be used by people in Mr. Jackson's house. Is that correct? That's correct. You examined the phone equipment throughout his house. Is that right? Yes, I did. And you noticed that were extension phones? Yes. Okay. And by the extension phone. We're talking about the phones that simply had buttons that allowed you to pick up and get an available line? That's correct. 10, the other phones were 10 button phones. All right. And those phones could also receive a call if somebody were to direct it to that particular extension. Is that right? 
That is correct. So if somebody answered the phone, they could say, I want to put this call through to the library, because I believe Mr. Jackson's in his library and it's for him, so I'll connect it to the library, right? Right, they could, yes, they could transfer the call to the library, yes. All right, and the phones that were at the ranch were at various locations throughout the house. Yes. Correct? In the children's living area, is that right? Yes. The library? Yes. The kitchen? Yes. The maid's room? Yes. The maid's break room, and then on into Mr. Jackson's personal office in the adjoining building? Yes. The security office at the end of that building, is that correct? Yes, sir. Upstairs in the video library? Yes, sir. All right, and you could also get the, or the phone system also included the front gate, the little guardhouse at the front gate, is that correct? I didn't examine that, I'm sure it did, I'm sure there was a phone out there, but I didn't. You mentioned an administration building, which was up on the top of the hill, correct? Yes. So it was outside the manicured lawn area that surrounded Mr. Jackson's private residence, is that correct? That's correct. And the administration building also is the fire department, they have a fire truck up there? I believe so, I believe so. So you had phone capability in the administration building for the various administrators, the fire department, and so on, is that correct? Yes. The administration building, there's an executive assistant or staff person up there who had a desk in the main administration building, correct? Yes. And that desk is where the main console existed for this phone system, is that right? Yes. All right, now, in the, you mentioned that you needed to have some kind of code to call out, is that correct? Yes. Is that unusual for a Merlin system? No, it's quite common. All right, so many systems you have to push 9 to call out? Some you have to press 9, and an account code is, is able to be programmed in so that you can eliminate phone abuse. People, unauthorized people making calls you don't want to make calls on your phone system. Now, you were out there with sheriffs who had a search warrant, correct? Yes, that's correct. So you were not chatting with the, with Mr. Jackson, I imagine? That is correct. Okay, and you weren't chatting with his staff about how they set the phone system up or how it was set up when they... That's correct. First came to work at the ranch? That's correct. So you weren't able to determine whether or not there were separate account numbers or there was just one number that everybody was given to get an outside line? That's correct. All right. Objection. Assumes everyone was given a number. Overruled. Did the answer. I think the answer came in. It did. He said, that's correct. So based on your analysis of this system, there could have been one number that would allow anybody on this Merlin phone system. Wherever the extensions were throughout the ranch, it would allow somebody to hit the number and get an outside line, correct? That's correct. All right. Did you determine? Let me withdraw that. So if somebody were able to make a phone call to an outside number, for instance, somebody were able to call their, let's say, boyfriend in Los Angeles from this phone, if they did it unassisted, they would have to have the code, whatever it was, to get that outside line, correct? Not from this phone, but from all the other phones, yes. Okay, okay, good point, thank you. I'm talking about the extension phones, and I guess I'm pointing to that one. Yes. But this phone. You can just pick up an outside line, correct? Uh-huh. And we'll come back to that. But as far as the extension phones are concerned, the ones that, other than the administration building and this phone, if you want to get an outside line, you put in whatever the code is. Correct. One number, or two numbers, or whatever it is. Correct. You get the outside line and then you can call wherever you want, right? That's correct. All right. So if somebody were, say, on an extension phone at some place on the ranch and they were able to call, as I say, for instance, their boyfriend in Los Angeles, you would expect that they would know how to enter that code to get the outside line, correct? Yes. And if somebody could enter that code and get an outside line to call their boyfriend in Los Angeles, they could enter that code, get an outside line, and call 911, correct? Yes. 
There's no restriction on calling 911 from any phone in this phone system other than simply knowing the code to call out, correct? Yes. If I could have just one moment, your honor. By the way, you mentioned the eight numbers, and then you said there were 16 other numbers, one of which was a direct line to Mr. Jackson's area in what's called the bathroom, but there's a sitting area and all that off the main floor. Uh-huh. Of the bedroom, correct? Uh-huh. Other than that direct number, did you ever figure out where on the ranch those other numbers, the other 15 numbers went? No. So when you say they came into the main, you didn't say, switch box, and I'm going to say that and I'm sure it's wrong, but the main, what did you call the telephone closet? DeMarc. Verizon's telephone DeMarc. Okay, so the lines come in from off the property, from the telephone lines off the property that service the rest of the world, and they come into the property, anybody's property, they come into a telephone box or telephone closet, correct? Uh-huh. And that's what you're calling the DeMarc? Correct. And you know that these other 15 lines came in there, you just never traced them out to see exactly where they went, correct? Correct. We put. I made sure that they had actual dial tone and on the block. And from my test set, you know, I have a code that I can dial in when I hear dial tone, and I can get a recording from the phone company that tells me what that telephone number is. So I verified that those, that those telephone numbers Mr. Jackson was being billed for those telephone numbers, he had live dial tone. Now, where it went, I don't know. In other words, you take your phone, you have a headset that has clips on it? Called a butt set. All right. It's a lineman, a lineman's test set. A lineman's test set, okay. And you simply clip that onto a line, correct, and then you dial a number, which we won't say, because everybody will go home and do it. Right. And it will automatically, it's kind of cool, automatically tell you what phone number that is, right? Exactly. And you verified that these are, in fact, phone numbers coming into the property, you just never traced them to see exactly whatever phones there were, if any, that were hooked up to them. Right, they weren't in the phone system. They were not in the Merlin phone system? Correct. But you don't know if there was another phone someplace, at the zoo, or someplace else that. That's correct. That might have had that number. All right, okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Green, did you go to the various outbuildings and check all the phones? Yes. We checked the, we looked for phones in the, in all of the buildings. And the only phones that we saw were the Merlin 10 button phones. Okay. We didn't see any other phones that weren't of the Merlin phone system. All right. So based on your inspection of the property, all the phones were hooked into the Merlin system, with the exception of the 15 which you couldn't find a location for. Those 15 lines, they could have been connected. And you had one private line? That's correct. They could have been connected to computers, other types of devices. Security. I'm sure some of those lines were security lines connected to the security companies, etc., etc. But we were not able to gain any information as to what they were connected to. Okay. And when you say, security, do you mean telephone lines as security or some kind of computer or alarm line? Alarm line. Computer. You know, for dialing out on the internet. You know, anything that took a telephone line. But not something you communicate on in the normal telephone fashion. Talk to somebody on? Well, they could have been used for that. They could have been. They could have been used for a computer to dial out to the internet. They could have been used for the alarm lines for the security system that Mr. Jackson had on the ranch. Okay, but you didn't find a source for that? No, and they might not have been connected to anything. All right, now, just as far as the exhibit that we've admitted here, there appears to be eight numbers at the top of this exhibit. Yes. Which are those numbers for? Those are the telephone lines connected to the Merlin system at Neverland Ranch. And then there's, below that there appear to be 15 lines. Those are the ones that you just talked about. Right. That don't hook into the Merlin system? Right, those are the wild lines. And the handwritten one on the bottom is the private line? Right, that's Mr. Jackson's private phone. And where did you find that phone that was hooked into a private line? That phone was in his rooming quarters downstairs in the bathroom to the left where the closet was. Okay. And this phone was also in the downstairs area? 
Yes. In the same, in the same place. Same general vicinity? Correct. Was this in the bathroom? If you recall. No, I think it was just outside the bathroom door. All right. Just right outside the bathroom door. All right. Now. Council, take our break. Very good.